Okay, well, I'm gonna give it a couple minutes for the attendees to join and then I'll jump right in. Uh -huh. I appreciate your comments on the paper, John. We can talk about those later, actually. I'd be interested in maybe following up a couple of them. So, okay, if sure. we don't get a chance here. So, okay, well, here come a few more. I'm going to get started. Um, so, welcome everyone to today's research presentation in conversation with Alexander Wendt. Uh, my name is John Oates. I'm an associate professor in the Politics and International Relations Department of the Green School, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's talk. So this Zoom talk is organized as a webinar, which means that only Professor Wendt and I will appear on screen. Uh, his presentation will run about 20 to 30 minutes, and then we can open it up for question and answer and discussion. Uh, when the time comes for the Q&A, uh, if you could please type your questions in the chat box and I'll read it off for Professor Wendt. Uh, try also to keep your questions somewhat brief. But before I introduce Professor Wendt, I'd like to acknowledge the support of the Green School and the Ruth K. and Shepard Broad Distinguished Lecture Series, which made this event possible. Organizing conversations about important ideas that challenge our taken for granted assumptions about the world is central to what makes the university a place of intellectual enrichment and knowledge production. These kinds of conversations are even more important today, given the challenges the US and the world currently face. So I wanna thank the Green School for providing the support that makes these conversations possible. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Alex Wendt. He is the Ralph D. Mershon Professor of International Security and Professor of Political Science at The Ohio State University. He received his PhD in Political Science from the University of Minnesota and taught at Yale, Dartmouth, and the University of Chicago before Ohio State. He's well known for his work on social theory and philosophy of science in the field of political science, and is one of the scholars who helped bring constructivism into mainstream IR scholarship. His 1999 book, Social Theory of International Politics, is widely cited as one of the central statements of constructivist IR and won the International Studies Association's Award for Best Book of the Decade in 2006. He's published articles in International Organization, European Journal of International Relations, the American Political Science Review, among others. And in the most recent 2017 TRIPS survey of over 3,700 IR scholars from around the world, he was named the scholar whose work has had the greatest influence on the field of IR in the past 20 years. Much of Professor Wendt's recent scholarship explores the implications of quantum physics for social theory. His 2015 book published by Cambridge University Press, Quantum Mind Social Science, lays out the philosophical and ontological foundations of a quantum social science, which has implications far beyond the study of world politics. In today's talk, Professor Wendt continues to explore those implications in his paper, Quantum Theory as Critical Theory, Alienation, Entanglement, and the Politics of Social Physics. Professor Wendt was my dissertation advisor at Ohio State, where I received my PhD, and his willingness to explore strange, difficult, and radical ideas has been a frequent source of inspiration for my own work, and I'm sure for the work of many others. So it's great to be able to host him here at FIU, even, even if it is only through Zoom. Uh, but please join me in welcoming Professor Wendt. Well, thank you, John. That was a very generous introduction, and thank you for inviting me, and thank you to everybody else in the ether for, for being here. It's a pleasure to be here, wherever that is. Um, I also wanted to apologize in advance. I'm having some vocal issues, and it's possible that my voice will give out halfway through, and you know, I hope it won't be too distracting, but we'll get through it. So, um, so the paper I'm presenting today is, um, has been long in the making, over a year. It's, it's finally almost done, but I need just little help to push it over the finish line. So on the one hand, this is a perfect time to present the paper um, because the feedback that I get from you guys will really be able to go immediately into an almost finished text. Um, on the other hand, 
this could be a terrible time to present if there's a silver bullet out there that kills the entire project. So I'm hoping that nobody has a silver bullet, or if you do, you'll keep it in the holster and just let me go on with my, my work. So, um, so we'll see what ha happens. Um, the paper is the first, actually the first really new paper I've done since the book in 2015. Everything else I've written has been kind of responding to critics, of which there are many. And so I've had to write several of the responses. Um, but this one is a new paper that kind of goes beyond the book uh, self-consciously, even though it does presuppose the book itself. Um, and in particular, what I do in this paper is explore what I see as some of the political implications of a quantum social science or quantum perspective, um, which I think in the long run could transform society um, globally if it were widely adopted. Now I'll get to that that part of the argument later in the talk, but I guess first I need to just talk a little bit about the idea of the book to kind of set the stage for the argument I'm making today. Uh, but I don't want to talk too long. So what follows really is just a very rough sketch to give you a sense of what I'm doing. And then we can fill the details in through Q&A as we, as we proceed, so. Okay, um, I want to begin by um, just trying to justify the entire idea of introducing physics into a discussion of social science. Um, and that I'll be coming back to this point at the end as well. Um, and it's justified in my view by a principle that I think upon reflection and maybe a beer or two, um, everybody in social science should accept, which is um, the, the principle no, usually known as the causal closure of physics or the CCP as I abbreviated it in the paper. Um, and I think the CCP is really the core or the fundamental principle of the modern scientific worldview. Um, which distinguishes science in some sense from religion or other kinds of non-scientific enterprises and so on. And there are different versions of what exactly the CCP means, but the bottom line is that it's saying there's really just one reality out there. It's the physical reality that's described by physics. Um, and so everything that's real in the world, in the universe, everything, everything including the thoughts in our heads, um, if they're gonna be real, they've gotta be in that physical reality somewhere, somehow instantiated there, okay, in the world described by physics, okay. Now, so that's a constraint on what we can do in social science, I'll suggest in a second. Now, I should emphasize here that this is not saying that social science should be reducible to physics or physical descriptions or equations. That would be crazy. None of us think in terms of equations or speak that way. Um, so there's no assumption there. The point is simply that every uh, description that a social scientist comes up with for their work or for, for social life that's qualitative or discursive in character, all those qualitative descriptions will have core, implicit correlated physical descriptions that a physicist in principle could put together if they wanted to. Okay, and so because of that correlation with physical descriptions, all of the stuff that we do in social science qualitatively, discursively and so on has to be consistent with physical law. We can't violate the laws of physics and the theories that we put forward is sort of the idea here. So in a sense, and the point is that physics is a constraint on what social science can legitimately do and still be a science, okay? Uh, if physics tells us that action at a distance is impossible, well, then action at a distance is impossible. And if you put that in your theory that it's possible, your theory is wrong, boom, end of story. So the laws of physics don't lie is kind of the usual one way to sort of bumper sticker version of this. The problem is which physics constraint, which CCP are we interested in or which one should we obey? Um, because since the 1920s, there have been two different options with completely different conceptions of physical law, completely different ontologies, epistemologies from top to bottom, and really completely different kinds of physics. Um, and one is much more constraining than the other. Okay, and so that's what I want to just briefly talk about that. The first then of the two options is the familiar uh, classical physics of Newtonian and energy, 19th century energy physics. Um, this kind of physics governs the behavior of, everyone agrees, governs the behavior of macroscopic inanimate objects, uh, material objects like planets, uh, glaciers, rocks, rivers, material objects in general follow the laws of classical physics perfectly. This kind of physics is deterministic, materialist. Uh, it's all about causal mechanisms. It's reductionist or atomistic. It's usually objectivist in some way. Um, and it works fantastically well for the study of material objects. If you wanna design a pulley or a car engine, you want classical physics and it will tell you how to do that. Now, importantly, classical physics also relies on a certain kind of logic, classical logic, um, which is a binary logic. 
um, and it also relies on classical probability theory. And I mention this because normally we would just take logic and probability theory for granted, but actually in the quantum perspective, there are actually two different kinds of logics, two different kinds of probability theory, and those are actually extremely important in the subsequent argument. Okay, so that's the classical worldview in a nutshell, okay? The other physics, of course, is quantum physics, which became consolidated in the 1920s. Uh, it was a complete revolution in how physicists viewed reality, um, and it subsumed classical physics um, as a mere limit case. Okay? And it essentially challenges every assumption of the classical worldview, although exactly how it challenges and what conclusions we should draw is very much debated and contested. So we, we can talk about that if you want, but I won't get into that now. But overall, one can say that in contrast to the classical picture, uh, the quantum world is non-deterministic. It's holistic rather than reductionist um, because it's about entanglement. Entanglement allows for action at a distance, which I'll talk a little bit more later. Um, and in principle, I think quantum theory can accommodate consciousness in a way that classical physics seems to have great difficulty doing. So quantum theory is not obviously materialist in the same way that classical physics is materialist. Um, and it's not even clear that quantum theory is even causal. Apparently quantum physicists hardly ever talk about causation, which I think is an interesting point that we could talk about more too in the Q&A. But most importantly, quantum physics then obeys its own laws. It has its own logic, quantum logic, which was formalized in 1933. It has its own probability calculus, which was, I guess, formalized around the same time. Um, so it's, it's just a completely different mathematical structure, axiomatic structure, and, and, and the underlying physical laws are fundamentally different. And the interesting thing about quantum theory, which um, is that it's all very mysterious to physicists themselves. They do not know why their theory, which is probably the best theory in the entire world that we have, they, do, they have no idea why the theory works as well as it does. They don't know what the theory means. They don't know what the theory is telling us about reality. So there's a lot of debate. That debate's been going on for over a century that may or may not relate to what we do in social science. Um, I won't get into the debate, but it's important to know that um, there's no agreement on what quantum theory means. There's agreement on what it does and that it works, but not on what it means. All right, so the question then for social science, I think, is which of these two physics then is the best description of social life and of the mind, because social life depends on the mind. Um, and so in effect, which physics constraint is the one that we should be choosing for our work, okay? Um, because the CCP tells us that it has to be one or the other. Everybody's got to choose one or the other. You can't, there's no way to kind of dodge the choice. At least I'm trying to force a choice here, whether, whether you, you may not want to talk, do that, but we can talk about that. Um, and I guess just thinking about it historically, this, the answer to this question, which one should we adopt? Historically, it was, it was simple because the social sciences were basically born in the 19th century at the height of classical physics. It wasn't even called classical then because there was no other kind of physics. Um, and basically social, early social scientists drank from the classical Kool-Aid in effect and brought on board all the classical physical assumptions about reality that the physicists gave us. Um, so that's fine. At, at the time, it made perfect sense to do it that way. Um, but then unfortunately, in the 1920s and later, social scientists ignored the quantum revolution and, and have ignored it ever since. Um, and so to this day, um, our CCP, our conception of physics remains deeply classical, including its logic and so on. And this is most obvious, I think, in disciplines like economics, um, but really anywhere where you can see methods training in any graduate program in any social science, methods training means classical probability theory, classical logic, classical statistics, okay? There's probably not even a mention of the fact that there is actually a quantum alternative. So that the training we give our students is thoroughly classical. So the bottom line in this first part of the talk, and then, and then I'll shift gears quickly, is that just despite the demise of the classical CCP over a century ago in physics, uh, we re have remained, we constrain ourselves in social science to classical principles, okay? which are much more constraining than, than quantum principles are, okay? But that may or may not be right or wrong. I mean, in the book, I argue that this is a huge mistake and that we shouldn't do this, that we shouldn't think of uh, social life in classical terms. But I should just say in, in the talk here that this is very much debated. Um, many people will argue that actually social life should be used, should, should be described in classical terms and not quantum terms. Um, there are lots of reasons for that. 
the debate goes back and forth. We can talk about that in the Q&A, um, but that's not really the focus of my talk right now. What I want to do right now is just assume that the quantum account of society is correct, which is a big leap, but give me that. And then the rest of the talk explores the political implications of, of that kind of assumption. Okay. Um, so I am assuming that, um, okay, so that's, that's good. All right. So, so, so what? Okay. What is all this philosophical, physical discussion? Um, how does that matter for social science and for the study of politics in particular? And I guess I want to point to two different levels on which this matters, one very briefly, and then the other one is the focus of what I have to say. The first more superficial level on which all this matters is the level that I was dealing with in the book, uh, which is that if the mind and society really are quantum mechanical phenomena, then if we want to understand them properly, we need quantum methods and quantum thinking to do so. Um, so in a sense, if we do that, and we actually implement quantum thinking and quantum methods in the study of social life, then social science will be better. It'll be more accurate as a social science. Um, it will explain things it couldn't explain before and so on. So it'll be a better scientific representation of the world, a more accurate one than we have now with the dominance of the classical view. So that's kind of the easy superficial way in which this matters. But there's a deeper level, I think, in which the quantum idea matters. And that is, um, it's more political and it's more critical. Um, and this is the level of pedagogy. Um, or is it pedagogy or gaji? I've, I've never known for sure. I'm gonna say gaji, but okay. Um, and here I'm referring not just to advanced methods training in the social sciences, although that's kind of the tip of the iceberg. I'm talking about pedagogy all the way down to kindergarten or even before. Um, and in particular then I'm interested in the kinds of human subjectivities that different kinds of pedagogies produce. And so let me just flesh that out. For two centuries or so, we've been teaching our kids and therefore ourselves um, that the objects in our minds obey the same physical laws that material objects like tables and chairs obey out in the world, okay? Classical laws, all right? This teaching is often implicit, but I think it starts at a very young age and it shapes fundamentally all of our minds in the way we think in very, very deep ways about the nature of logic, the nature of probability, the nature of rationality, and so on. It's a very deep imprint, I think, of this kind of classical socialization, classical pedagogy um, on the human mind going back to you know, preschool or whatever. In a sense, all that classical pedagogy is training us to think in classical terms to be classical subjects where we can't actually think any other way, at least self-consciously think any other way, except in these relatively confined terms, okay? So quantum social science, I think, suggests that this classical mode of subjectivity, that if you assume that that's natural, which is the usual assumption that that's natural, that this is actually a fundamental mistake, um, a social misconstruction, if you will, of the physical reality. Um, which I'm assuming is actually quantum rather than classical. Um, and so in a sense, what's going on here is a repression of the awareness that we are actually quantum beings. So bumper sticker version here is that classical nurture is repressing quantum nature is kind of the, and I'm trying to reverse the balance here. Or you could call this repression by the limit case. You know, social science from a classical view is really theorizing always from the limit case. Why would you do that? You should end with the limit case, not begin with the limit case. So, but then the larger idea here is that this kind of teaching and this repression of awareness of our quantum nature and, and our not acknowledging that creates a kind of false consciousness, which limits human agency um, and has all kinds of downstream negative effects. So I have a brief example in the paper talking about um, the difference that these two different pedagogies make. Um, there are lots of other examples one could talk about, but I focus on the idea of entanglement in particular and what entanglement has to say about the nature of human individuals or, the, or individuality. In the classical view of individuality or the individual, it's materialistic, atomistic, and so on. Um, and what you end up with is a picture of the individual that is completely contained within our skin. That your skin is your boundary and beyond your skin, that's where you're, you no longer have, your individuality is not there because physically you're inside your skin. We live inside our bodies, right? Um, so it's a view of individuals, and this is the term that is used in physics. It's a view of individuals as being fully separable, 
that we're completely separate bodies. You can take away your body, my body will still be here, all right? So the idea here is that you are you and I am me and nothing about me depends on anything about you or vice versa, okay? You're just you and I'm, you're, I'm just me, okay? And after all, I'm in my brain, I'm not in your brain and vice versa and so on, okay? In the quantum view, in contrast, the mind is still in the brain, obviously, uh, in the human case, but because it's a quantum mind, the assumption here is that our minds are entangled um, non-locally with other minds, other brains, um, in a physical non-local sense, which is described by quantum theory and its ideas about entanglement. So in a sense, from a quantum perspective, it, it makes perfect sense to say that our minds extend beyond our bodies, they extend outside in a non-local way, okay? In a quantum way, not in a classical way, but it's, it's, it's still in a real way. And where this leads in the long run, and I won't say much more about this, but um, is there's a famous quote from Schrodinger, one of the greatest um, quantum physicists, who said that it's basically that in the end, um, there's only one universal mind, okay? It's a kind of a universal mind idea, at least among human beings, um, by virtue of the fact that we all speak languages or the same language in some way, okay? Um, so the upside of this is instead of saying you are you and I am me, it's saying that we're not fully separable beings. Instead, I am you in certain contexts and you are me when we're interacting with each other. Now, when we're not interacting with each other, perhaps I'm not you and vice versa, but when we're interacting, there's a sense in which who I am, who we are depends on who we're with and not something that's separate intrinsic to our bodies, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So the problem, of course, is that the classical view suppresses this picture of the individual as being entangled with all other individuals and creates what I'm calling a false consciousness. And actually the analogy, which I'm gonna put in, this is one of the sections of the paper that's not yet written, um, is the, there's a fair bit of literature that shows that teaching economics to undergraduates distorts their minds and makes them more selfish. Um, and that's exactly the kind of thing that I'm talking about here with how classical thinking, I think, has a similar kind of effect of which economics in a way is just kind of the most extreme version. Um, but the larger story then is that this false consciousness creates alienation from nature, from each other, and ultimately from ourselves in a, in a picture of the individual that is sort of alone and estranged from everything. So it's a very depressing kind of uh, lonely picture of the individual that we get with the uh, classical view. Um, and the, the kicker here, and this is an interesting uh, point from quantum theory, quantum game theory shows that the more entanglement you have between actors, the more that they can cooperate beyond what classical game theory tells you they can cooperate. Um, and so being alienated in a, in a way reduces the ability of actors to be entangled because they don't realize they're entangled. They see themselves as being in a Hobbesian state of nature in a sense, which is kind of a, a perfect example of a classical uh, model. Um, and because we don't see our entanglement, we're not able to cooperate as much as we can, or we could in principle, um, if we were aware of our quantum nature. So in a sense, by teaching ourselves that we are only classical beings, we're producing people or subjects who are less able to cooperate than those who, if they understood their true nature, um, would be able to cooperate. And given the global scale on which human beings need to cooperate these days in the face of pandemics, climate change, and everything else, the last thing we need is an ideology like classical social science that reduces our natural proclivity to cooperate and alienates, alienates us from each other and from nature more generally. So introducing a quantum pedagogy all the way down to preschool um, would over time, I think, create a less alienated, more cooperative kind of human being, an emancipated human being, and that to me would be a good example of critical theory. Now, I could go on a bit more, but I think my inclination is to, if I have a conclusion, the conclusion addresses the issue of, um, do we really need this? Okay, and so maybe, because I always get that question, so I was going to anticipate it, but maybe I'll just stop here. Um, and then if somebody wants me to talk about, do we really need this? I can give the conclusion then. But I, my inclination is to um, turn the floor over to John and, and see what, what happens. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so if you have a question, you should be um, using the Q&A function rather than the chat. The chat's disabled for participants. Um, so if you have a question for 
Professor Went, just type it in the Q&A and I can read it out so that everyone can hear it and then he'll have a chance to respond. Um, okay, so we have one. Um, this is from Brianna Hernandez. She's a graduate student in our department. Uh, and she asks, how do you, in acknowledging the one in the many, help combat languages of othering? Um, so this is the one in the many, which I didn't talk about in the talk, but in the paper, there's this argument that at the end, I talk about crimes against humanity and wanting to, showing that the quantum view can actually, from a classical perspective, the idea of crimes against humanity makes no sense at all. It's an incoherent concept. Uh, it's, that's how I read it. From a quantum view, actually, humanity would be a natural kind. It's a real thing, in a sense, because of this non-local uh, entanglement. Um, so, and that's part of the attraction of quantum theory to me, which is that it's universal. It applies to all people, all the time, all organisms, and all things equally. Okay, so there's no favoritism or bias or propulism and so on. So, um, to answer the question, I think maybe this is a bit indirect, but um, the... Um, Othering, in a sense, is the, the, the prototypical classical maneuver where you separate, you, you, in a sense, sever the entanglement, you take yourself out of the picture, and then you view the other as an object. And that basic distinction between subject-object getting created, that's something that quantum theorists are very interested in, how that distinction gets created in the first place. And I, would, I guess I would locate othering as one species of that larger issue of, of subject-object um, construct or division. Um, and I think reminding ourselves that at the end of the day, we are all one mind in a sense, universally entangled um, through language, presumably will reduce the amount of othering that, that um, is necessary because othering, um, I mean, why would you other people that you realize are entangled with you? I mean, maybe there'd be other reasons to other, but I don't think it'd be quite as bad as it is now. So that's the whole thing. Anyway. Okay. Um... She actually had a second question that came in, which I think is related to uh, your answer. So I, I'm just going to ask it here, which is about um, how hierarchy might exist in this concept of entanglement. Um, what does this perspective say about the power dynamics that influence the acceptance of things, such as particular human rights, as universal? And more broadly, I mean, building on that, we could ask, what role does power and um, politics play in this quantum perspective? Um, yeah. Well, it's funny. I mean, my first book, everybody criticized it because, well, there were lots of reasons to criticize it, but everybody criticized it because I didn't talk about power very much. And the second book, I don't talk about power very much either. So this seems to be a weak spot in my sort of social theorizing. Um, I think power fits very naturally, um, not the kind of um, kinetic power necessarily that we normally think about when we talk about material power, but I think power in a more social sense fits very naturally within the quantum framework and the collapse of the wave function. When you collapse the wave function, you are creating stuff out of, out of nothing in a sense. And that's the ultimate kind of power that one could have. So um, there is a place for power in the overall framework and I, I need to think more about that and how it fits. Um, I haven't thought much about applying this framework to particular issues like hierarchy and stuff like that. Um, I just haven't got there. I'm still working on sort of the, the philosophical stuff. Um, but you know, I don't think there's any reason. I mean, the ontology here is fundamentally flat in the sense that individuals are the are the root, are the are the um, the pieces. But of course, these are entangled individuals, not atomistic ones. So it's a flat ontology. But there's no reason in a flat ontology that you couldn't delegate. You know, you couldn't create a president, for example, um, or or somebody else. So there's no reason there couldn't be hierarchy. Um, I do think that one of the things that hi that that the quantum perspective highlights about hierarchy is how holistic it is. It's not a mechanic, it's not a machine. Hierarchy is not a machine. It's not a mechanical kind of thing. It's a holistic thing. If the president says something, we're going to war, instantly all of his or her soldiers are targets, instantly uh, from the enemy and so on. So I think the, the ability for non-local causation, action at a distance is actually through hierarchy, very, very powerful perhaps. And that might be one of the connections. Actually, I should think, I'm gonna make a note about that. Um, thank you, okay. So, all right, just a second. Okay, all right. great. Uh, so we have questions keep coming in, so I'm just going to go through them. Mm -hmm. um, this is another question from a graduate student, Garrett Pierman. Uh, he asks, what you think of actor network theory? I don't know if you're familiar with that work, mm -hmm. and how does that converse with quantum social theory? 
Well, I'm a little bit familiar and I've read, I mean, Latour, I've read a little bit of Latour and some of the other, um, is it just Ant or A-N-T? I'm not sure what the, how it's pronounced. Um, my, and I, my impression is that at the end of, I mean, for me, and this is maybe binary thinking, which I should be presumably beyond, but I'm still engaging in it. There, there are either classical views or there are quantum views and there's nothing really in between. Maybe there's stuff that's mixed, I'm not sure. Um, Ant strikes me as at the end of the day, a classical perspective, um, but wanting to be more. And this is, I think, true of other, some other classical perspectives or other perspectives that have elements of classical thinking implicit in them still, but they're trying to break free of that. So, um, so I guess I'm, I, I don't know enough about Ant to really give a, a proper um, response. I have, I have some kind of, my priors here are a bit skeptical because I know enough that this isn't, doesn't sound quantum, they're not invoking quantum theory. Um, and if you're not invoking quantum theory in all of its concepts, then chances are this is some kind of a classical variant on a classical approach, um, which doesn't mean it can't be used or something that's useless. It's just that it would be different, I think. Right. Okay. Uh, so we have a question here from Kenneth Lepartido. Um, he says, you focus on individuals and new ways to conceptualize individuals. But the social can also be seen as something more than individuals, assemblages of people and objects, emergent qualities that cannot be reduced to individuals. So he asks, does your theory include or contemplate this? Yeah, actually, that's in a sense the point of the whole theory is to show that individuals are not stripped down separate abstract individuals, but that individuals embody the whole within themselves. So the, the, the many, the one is in the many, in a sense. Um, and so, and there's very explicitly in the book, there's a discussion of quantum emergence or emergence from a quantum perspective, which is very, very interesting, the literature on that. It's quite different than emergence, the way we normally talk about it in social science. And I think it's actually much more satisfactory. Um, so yes, emergence is definitely part of the story. Um, and actually every decision that people make from a wave function is a form of emergence in a sense. I think because it's kind of spontaneous and, and um, not reducible to what was there before. Um, so yes, I mean, my view of the individual is fundamentally social and relational and holistic. And the whole point is to give that a physical basis. I mean, a lot of people already believe that the individual is relational and holistic. This gives it a physics basis that it didn't have before. Right. Okay, so we have a question. Um, she says she's a, in a staff in the library. Uh, and I'm gonna dovetail on her question because I had a similar question. So she asked, how exactly can quantum physically be put in practice in our everyday life? And can you give an example? And just to add to that um, is to ask a question about what you think needs to change uh, in order for this quantum social science to um, really take hold. Uh, so what do we need in terms of training, scholarship, funding for quantum social science? Um, how would we affect this kind of paradigmatic shift uh, now, the original question from Ivy was about sort of in our daily lives, and that's a really important one, too. And I'm also asking about in, in the academy, how would we bring about this new quantum perspective? And perhaps here you could say something about that, the quantum boot camp um, that you're setting up. Oh, um, yeah. Don't let me forget about the boot camp because I want to do a <laughs> pitch for it and advertise. Um, the question about daily life, that's very, it's funny, that's a very challenging question. Uh, <coughs> I'll have, let me see if I can answer it in a few minutes. So I'm going to park that one for a second and, and try John's first, which I'm, is more familiar terrain. Um, actually, I was talking to a colleague in my department just recently about his views on quantum. And, and he's been you know, getting more interested as I've been talking it up and stuff. And his view is that he's now to the point where, um, A, he thinks there should be some special little boutique niche in political science for quantum work. And that should be okay to do that kind of work. So that's a small, that's a small victory. But the other thing he said is that um, he also believes that in research projects, graduate students should be taught in graduate school that when they undertake projects, any kind of research project, they should always ask themselves, should I use classical methods for this project or quantum ones? And why would I choose one or the other? And Mike's, Michael's view was that, well, many times you might still choose classical because it's easier or whatever, okay? And we can disagree about that. But, um, but I think that's actually the key thing is getting students and faculty to actually see, them, that, see themselves as making an implicit choice every single time we do anything in our research, we're making a choice between a classical and a quantum framework. 
whether explicitly or implicitly. I think those choices should be made explicit and then we can talk about it. And we talk about the pros and cons and there needs to be a long discussion about this. And you know, the physicists themselves with much better data and everything else took them 20 or 30 years to kind of work through the, the implications of these ideas for their worldview. Um, it'll take at least as long, I think, for social scientists to do that uh, if we get that far. Um, but I do think it'll have to start in the universities, in graduate programs, methods training. That's the easiest place to kind of start offering an alternative method sequence, for example. You could say you can do classical methods or you can do quantum methods, something like that. Um, the other thing that has to change, though, and this is something that I, one reason the boot camp is uh, we're doing the boot camp, um, is that the kinds of math that students leave college with don't prepare you to do quantum theory at all. And in, in fact, in college, very, very few students, except physics majors and maybe some computer scientists now, very, very few students are ever exposed to quantum theory. And, and it involves a special kind of math, special probability theory and everything else. And none of that stuff is familiar. And so I've had colleagues, I had a colleague at Chicago, a, a very high end economist, a game theory economist, and I showed him some quantum game theory and he couldn't even read the couldn't even read it because the symbols were so alien and he had, had was extremely teched up. So there needs to be some training in the undergraduate level in sort of basic kind of pre quantum ideas in a way, even if they're not going to really do the math. I think there needs to be more exposure on a qualitative and a more formal level of students to quantum theory so that there's a supply of students entering grad school then who have enough tools to pursue these ideas at the graduate level. So the purpose of the boot camp very quickly, it was supposed to be in person. We got a big grant from Carnegie. Carnegie's actually really sold on, on the Carnegie Foundation's very sold on this quantum stuff, at least for the time being. Um, it was a two year grant in person originally to bring in about 40 students, grad students, postdocs, undergrads maybe, who want a two week intensive exposure to quantum theory, both qualitative and more formal. And it would be kind of a, just really rudimentary, but very intensive. We had some very good speakers, very high-end people that agreed to do it. And then of course COVID came, it's gonna be online in July instead this year. Um, but if you're interested, definitely send me an email um, for the online version, anybody can come. And so it's very easy. Um, and it's gonna be, we're working it out. It's gonna be really interesting, I think, so. Yeah, that's great. Um, and did you wanna to try to tackle uh, Ivy's question about? The daily life. Well, I think, um, I mean, the lesson in the paper, I mean, quantum theory has many lessons. One that I focus on in the paper is that individuality and our sense of self is much more relational than we think it is. And of course, many social scientists have said that for a long time already, but now we have maybe physics to tell us that. And seeing ourselves in a relational way means that, um, well, actually, oh, I've got the perfect answer. This is it, this is it. Um, it's actually even in the book. Um, one of the implications of quantum theory <coughs> or at least one of the things it seems to be an implication is that there may not be any causation in social life. And in particular, um, from a quantum perspective, I cannot make John angry. Um, I cannot make someone else happy, okay? What happens instead is you make yourself angry in response to how someone else has acted over here. And so each of us is doing our own thing in our own little bubbles, but because we're all entangled, we're reacting to um, how each other is acting, but it's not mechanical. It's not kinetic the way it is in a classical world. Um, it's much more kind of a, a joint potentiality. Um, and, um, and then I forgot where I was going with that, but that's, that was, I guess, the end of my thought for the moment. Okay. But okay. Um, I think that that is, damn, I just, it was, um, yeah, it was the idea that people are not interacting. We're not interacting directly really. And, that, and when we do get angry, it's we're making ourselves angry. We have a choice on how to respond to somebody else's action toward us, right? And that choice is kind of free will and that's the quantum choice. And maybe if we all kind of were more cognizant of that choice and making that choice, we would get into fewer arguments because we wouldn't be making each other angry all the time because that's not even possible. Hmm. That's interesting. I, just as an aside, that is sort of how my children were taught in kindergarten was kind of that kind of approach to managing their emotions. So I wonder oh. if maybe there is some kind of quantum ontology that's trickling into the early years of education. Um, well, can I just briefly address that? I mean, I should emphasize, and I didn't say this in the talk, 
clearly there are many factors socializing young minds in quantum in sort of implicit physics is only one. And many of those forces that are socializing young minds are implicit quantum forces, I think. So mm -hmm. it's really a kind of which side is going to win kind of issue more than anything. Okay, so we have a, another question here. Um, we have a number of questions, actually. Uh, this is from Suzanne Zwingle. She's a professor in our department mm -hmm. um, and deals with a question that I also have. Um, so she says, relationality or entanglement in your talk is something that many theoretical perspectives in social sciences focus on, often from positions that were excluded from the modern autonomous subject, non-Europeans, women, traditions of post-colonialism, feminism, etc. Are these influences relevant for your focus on quantum physics? Well, they show that relational ideas have go back probably to the beginning of time. And in fact, there are several people who are working on indigenous knowledges and indigenous ontologies and pointing out that the resonances with quantum ideas. Likewise, people who work on Buddhism and Taoism have noted a lot of resonances there. So again, this is a very ancient kinds of religions that embody relational ideas. So in that sense, post-colonial, um, yes, in a sense, the individualism of the classical worldview is, is actually very um, historically in some ways, I don't know if it's unique, but it's, it's um, probably the exception rather than the norm. It's, in, uh, it's, it's just a Western thing perhaps. And, and um, but so the ever traditions, there are many traditions that involve relational thinking and certainly within social science itself, we now have a big resurgence of relational thinking um, and so on. So these are all relevant in one sense. They're relevant in the sense of translating the physics in a sense into politics and social theory, just like we've always been doing. The difference is, or what the quantum perspective brings, I think, is a physical ground or a physical foundation to these claims of relationality that I think other many people are skeptical of. And a good example, I think, would be the crimes against humanity, but also what about the idea of structural violence, which I talk about briefly in the paper. From a classical perspective, there cannot be anything really meaningfully that you could call structural violence. What you have are a long series of local causation, local chains of, of, of violence, which if you add them all up, you can call them structural violence. From a quantum perspective, you can talk about structural violence in a much more holistic way. It's not reducible in any way to local causal interactions. It's emergent. Um, and that justifies then the idea of structural injustice, which maybe is harder to justify from a classical perspective. Um, and that's obviously a very political kind of issue. If you can justify the idea that there's structural injustice and structural violence, that's politically quite salient. So it helps in a way physics, the idea here is that the physics is giving existing relational arguments and it's an unlikely ally. I wanted them to be allies in a sense. Usually the people who do relational and qualitative stuff or many people don't want anything to do with this physics stuff. They don't want this ally, right? <laughs> Get out of here, <laughs> you're kind of messing up the story. Um, but I do think there's a natural alliance here and, and um, both sides need the other. So. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the nature of the q and in Zoom talk is that people ask questions uh, and they type them in. Some of them are closely related to others that have been asked and answered. Um, others are not. So um, I'm going to make an effort to try to bring some coherence to the questions um, a bit by moving past some that I think we've addressed a bit and then maybe coming back to it if we have time. Um, okay. So uh, otherwise, I think we might get a little disjointed going back and forth between topics. Um, am I talking too long or am I doing okay? No, no, this is okay. great. I mean, uh, okay. <laughs> it's a lot of interest. So okay. uh, I'm just trying to make sure we're not spinning around and coming back to the same question every couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm going to stick with this focus on how your approach relates to existing uh, approaches in political science and social theory, um, but moving a little more closer to political science, if we could. Um, so this is a question from uh, Felix Martin, who's also a professor in our department. And he asks, uh, can you discuss how this quantum approach can help us understand better and seek more coordination about, uh, say, the problems of the commons? Uh, and just to add to that, what, what kind of practical implications might this perspective have for solving uh, existing political problems, which there are many and they are severe. <laughs> yes, well, 
some of those problems, many of them require collective action. Um, and it's one of the big implications of a quantum perspective <coughs> um, is that collective action actually, um, because it involves, well, um, it's easier than we think it is because of entanglement. And quantum game theory tells us that entanglement is a unique resource to help human beings cooperate. And if you, have, if you had a world of zero entanglement, you have a Hobbesian state of nature, we know what that looks like. An entangled world is one where cooperation is easier. And the quantum game theory proves that mathematically. And, the, and actually, it even gets better than that, because the more entanglement you have, the more propensity to cooperate you get, above and beyond what the classical models predict. So the idea here, then, is that if people understood themselves not as abstract individuals in comp Hobbesian competition with each other, but instead understood themselves as entangled in some kind of universal mind or at least in a holistic kind of system, they're going to think of the nature of the interaction differently. They're going to think of, they're probably going to be more cooperative intuitively. And the physical correlation of that would be a higher degree of entanglement. So I think the idea here is really to transform our self consciousness through a kind of critical theory, transform our self consciousness in a more relational direction overcome this kind of individualistic bias, and that'll make it easier to solve problems of the commons and collective action problems more generally. Okay. Um, so I have a question here from France Williams. He says, can you expand on how singularities, differences uh, are related to otherness or alterity, otherness from within? Um, so he also says, this is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. I gather a sense uh, that your quantum work may resonate a la other thinkers like Derrida, Foucault, and Spivak. Um, so I guess there's two questions there about alterity and otherness, uh, which you sort of addressed when you answered Brianna's question, but I think there's kind of a different take here. And a separate question about, uh, which overlaps with this focus on relationalism, how does your approach relate to sort of post-structural theory? Um, and how is it different, or you see yourself as allied with those thinkers? Well, it's, it's tricky because in the old days, when I thought I was allied with them, they didn't want to be allied with me, and that was fair. Now I understand why. I didn't really understand at the time, but now I do. Um, so I, the second question is easier for me. I'm not sure I know how to answer. I, I guess I would ask John to repeat the first question, but let me try the second one. Um, in terms of post-structuralism, it's very interesting. There are some post-structuralists, or many of them have already morphed into new, new materialists anyway. Um, and some of them have broken off and joined the quantum crowd. And actually, Mark Salter, who is, you know, has excellent credentials as a post-structuralist and a new materialist, he um, you know, put together a special issue of Security Dialogue on quantum IR. And, is, is very, and he's writing a chapter for us and so on and, and elsewhere. And, so, um, and there are other post-structuralists or people coming out of a post-structural tradition um, who also are sort of sympathetic. Now, I think on the other side, you have I, my other experience that I've had with, with post-structuralists is that there's a lot of skepticism and wariness about the physics part. And the physics part is um, problematic in various ways, complicated in various ways. But interestingly, the physics part itself, if you look at the work of someone like Arkady Plotnitsky, who's a professor of English, I think he's at Purdue, he's written several books on the epistemology of quantum theory. Um, and it's all Derrida and it's all post-structural. So, and also Karen Barad is also, you know, you know post-structural feminist Butlerian theory and she's doing quantum theory. So um, there are a lot of connections. I think what the quantum stuff does, what it brings to post-structuralism that post-structuralism does not really have right now is a whole armory of extremely well-developed, refined concepts that everybody agrees on. Entanglement, collapse of the wave function, superposition. Uh, I mean, there's just, you know, there's a dozen or at least of unique quantum concepts that are excellent to be used in the social sciences, I think. Um, and I think that if, if, you know, for example, when I hear the word assemblage, I don't know what an assemblage is, okay? And I don't, I don't, I don't know what physicists would make up an assemblage. Um, but if I know what, a, I do know what a sort of a quantum social system is. And so, in that sense, the vocabulary of quantum theory, I think, brings something to, to post-structuralism that could be challenging, but it would be an interesting dialogue to have, I think, between the two universes. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to shift to another series of questions, um, which 
overlaps with a question I had uh, myself. Um, so I'm going to start with a question from um, Julie Zhang, who's a professor in our department. She says, it seems to me that socialist states tend to embrace the idea of collectivism, while capitalist states embrace the idea of individualism. Do you think collectivism and socialist ideology draw insights from quantum physics? And I'm going to add to that a question from Valeria Popova. Um, and this is one I also had. Um, she puts it very succinctly. She says, how do you prevent the idea of entangled individuals and being as a whole from falling into Hegelian totalitarianism? Um, yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> well, even though the effort here is to um, emphasize that all human beings are holistically entangled, we're one, we're one organism in a sense, or one mind, um, the argument is also very clear, and this is backed up by what the physicists themselves say about what goes on with particles. Um, it's not saying that it's not eliminating individuality completely. Um, we remain separable to some extent. We're just not fully separable the way we are in the classical world. So we retain our individuality. And because we're quantum systems where we have free will and indeterminacy and all that, so that's an important part of the story that I didn't talk about, but is I would probably bring up at this point, um, which also helps in, in a way is also very Butlerian in its, in its focus, right? Everybody repeats it. We're all doing the same things, but we're all doing it in our own little unique ways. So there is freedom all over the place. Um, and and I, I would say this is not just humans. I think all, all organisms have free will. And that's one implication of the larger argument of the book. Um, but I think, you know, totalitarianism, I can't say that that would never happen in a quantum world. Um, but I think that, um, you know, collectivism in the old fashioned totalitarian sense is really about the suppression of the individual um, and a, not a recognition of the individual at all. Um, and that would not, that would never happen, I think, in a quantum perspective. Um, it's a, it's a perspective. And I think actually the reason it does happen in the, in the socialist states is precise, probably precisely because the underlying ontology is classical. And so the only way that they can kind of escape individualism is with this opposite kind of extreme um, collectivism, which obviously is politically very problematic. But it's a good question. And that's something that, that relates to the hierarchy issue and the power, power issue that I need to think about some more. So, um, Well, while we're on that topic, I have another question <laughs> just to uh, further complicate your answers here. Um, so this is a question from Tamanisha John. She's a graduate student in our uh, department. So she writes, the end goal from the description that you just gave in your presentation seems to be one in which states one which states that human nature can lend itself to social harmony or cooperation if we weren't taught uh, or learned through classical pedagogies that provide us with a false consciousness about individualism as self-preservation and as rational. But doesn't this simplify real antagonisms that exist in our social relations, uh, class, race, gender, and other social standings? Also, because of how we're taught in society, doesn't this make the sort of ideological transformation that you're suggesting harder without actual revolution in the literal sense? Uh, so I guess there's two parts there. Um, so. Yeah, that's a good question. I think, and actually part of the argument of the paper is that this classical thinking underwrites and supports structures of domination like racism, sexism, and the binary thinking in particular, which people have you know, been hammering away at for decade after decade, binary thinking is bad. Well, it comes from classical physics because real world objects in the material world observe the logic of binary thinking, binary logic. So um, in that sense, <coughs> I think some of the real, the real antagonisms are there. I think they, many of them have a classical foundation or classical rationales or implicit classical uh, thinking that is helping to sustain them. But again, that's not a guarantee that everything is going to be hunky-dory and peace and love with, with a quantum perspective. Um, but I do think that dismantling, I think that um, if people began to see themselves as in, entangled, and if people began to realize that logic does not have to be binary, and probability does not have to be the way we normally, if people began to break out of a classical perspective, it would be harder to justify some of these structures of domination, which depend on that kind of thinking. You can't other somebody else as easily if you're entangled with them because you're really then othering yourself, right? If, if you are me and I am you, then othering is, is going to be more difficult than if you see yourself as already separate, naturally separate, and so on. So 
Um, but yes, the real antagonisms in the long run will delay this process. It's really a matter of changing the mindset about you know, how, what it is that's going on in the nature of social life more generally, I guess. Okay. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit towards some more skeptical uh, <laughs> comments. Um, so this is from an anonymous attendee, um, but I think it's an important question that I'm sure you've heard many times before. Uh, and it goes, given that classical physics is for good reason, the basis of 99.9% .9 of our explanation and understanding of physical reality and quantum physics is barely understood or known, how responsible and useful is it to suggest such a revolution in the social sciences based on such a fringe limited quantum physics? Um, well, I guess I, I would challenge the numbers there first, if I mean, that's an odd way to respond, but I think what's clear is that uh, quantum theory subsumes classical theory, and classical theory is only a tiny little portion of the quantum world. Um, so it's not as if quantum theory is only explaining 1% and classical is explaining everything else. It's actually the reverse. If you look at the universe as a whole, the whole universe is one gigantic quantum system, and quantum field theory is supposed to explain everything. I don't understand quantum field theory, but that's what people tell me. So, um, so there's that issue. I would say that we have to put classical physics in its proper place, which is that it's a special case, a limit case of the quantum perspective. Okay, so that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is, this is not purely a theoretical argument. It's an empirical argument in part based on the findings of quantum decision theorists, which I didn't talk about, I was going to talk about, but it was just too long to put in the talk. But in the past 20, well, it's really the past 10 years, um, a, lot of, several, a number of mathematical psychologists and physicists have quantized expected utility theory or rational choice. They replaced all the axioms of rational choice that were classical with quantum versions of those axioms. You get a quantum version of rational choice. They ran that against all the experimental data that psychologists have found have, have generated. And in particular, it ran it against the kahneman tversky results that animate, you know, have animated work in psychology for 40 years. And it turns out that a quantum decision model predicts all the kahneman tversky anomalies. This is an extraordinarily powerful result, it seems to me, in social science. We hardly ever get that kind of resolution of anomalies, a unified resolution of anomalies with one theory. Um, and that work seems to be pretty solid. And I'm not seeing people saying this is all wrong. So if that's true, if that claim holds up that the behavior of human cognition and decision making fits a quantum description better than a classical one, then it's incumbent, then the, then the burden of proof switches. The burden of proof is now on the classical defender to say, well, even though it looks quantum, it really is classical. But then you've got to explain how a classical brain could produce quantum behavior. And that, that would be a pretty big challenge. So I think you know, empirically, and is the empirics are, and quantum biology is now emerging too, which no one expected 20 years ago. And suddenly we've got a quantum biology and birds and plants use quantum effects. So I think it is fringe. It was certainly fringe when I started this, uh, even more fringe than it is now, but the science is getting more and more deep. Um, and I think if you look at the future, I mean, the classical framework is exhausted when it comes to the mind-body problem and many other things. So I'm, I'm very skeptical that we're gonna get much more leverage in that direction. So this leads, I think, to another question um, from, this is it, from another graduate student, Ali Ascucci. Uh, and he asked, so what about causality and positivist methodology embedded in classical mechanics and relations between social phenomenon um, when it comes to quantum mechanical relations between social intersubjective entities? Um, I mean, what I think is a similar question is, well, what are we going to do with all of this, these theories and explanations we have in IR and political science? Should, do we need to jettison those once we move to a quantum worldview? Or how do you reconcile the knowledge we've produced with uh, this new sort of metaphysics? No, that's that's an excellent question, too. I think, um, I mean, if it's the case that there's no causality in quantum theory, and there's some debate about that, but if there is, it's certainly very different than um, the kind of causality that social scientists usually talk about, then there is going to be a fundamental um, difference between the two. You know, in social science, we're trained to look for causal mechanisms. And even that phrase, causal mechanisms, you can just hear the classical physics right behind there, right? That's a classical idea. Quantum physicists never talk about quantum causal mechanisms. So there is a basic difference about causality. On the other hand, um, I don't think that's the case <coughs> that we would just throw out all the existing social science we've done 
first, because a lot of it may be implicitly quantum anyway, um, and even some of the more technical stuff um, and maybe getting at things. I think what we need to do is what the quantum decision theorists did with rational choice, which is to quantize selected bodies of work or selected theories and say, okay, we're going to go quantize, um, you know, this theory of European integration. Okay. And we're going to substitute out quantum axioms for the classical ones. And then how does that change our way of thinking? Um, so I think it's really for every theory we've come up with, every finding we've come up with, every statistical finding that's been published in the APSR should be checked against a quantum reading in effect. And sometimes that might lead to a change. It might lead to a flip in the results, or sometimes it might be, well, it doesn't really make much difference. And that would help us decide whether to choose quantum methods or classical methods in any given research project too. So I think that would be a useful exercise to move the field toward figuring out when to use these two different approaches. I guess I, I wanted to follow up on that. So you have another paper on um, the UFO phenomenon where you advocate militant agnosticism right? like, <laughs> towards that phenomenon, right? That we don't, we don't say for sure whether we know what they are or we don't know what they are, or rather we remain sort of undecided until the evidence comes in. And I wonder, uh, is that the attitude we should also have towards quantum social science that it is, as you've said, speculative? Right? We don't know for sure if the brain is a quantum computer. There might be a lot of sort of uh, circumstantial evidence that would support that, right? But until we know for sure, given what's involved in moving towards a quantum social science, shouldn't we kind of wait and see, uh, remain sort of militantly agnostic about uh, whether the world, whether social science is quantum or classical? Yeah, no, I think... Um... I, well, I mean, I think social scientists, if we remained, let's say we just decided to bracket all the quantum stuff and just sort of remain agnostic about it and just not do it, then what we would in effect be doing is waiting for other sciences, brain science, uh, biology, um, computer sciences, to make advances that then we can then look at and say, okay, well, that makes it more or less plausible that we can import these ideas into social science. So we're kind of abdicating any role in the development of these ideas. Now, to my mind, that's, we actually have a crucial role to play because for once, social science is really important because we're the ones that embody these quantum ideas on the macroscopic level, right? It's not just quantum physics anymore at the subatomic level, it's quantum stuff channeled through human beings. And so we're actually at the top of the food chain instead of the bottom of the food chain, perhaps. And, um, and, and, um, but you're right, we don't know if it's true. And on the other hand, if we don't, if people don't explore these ideas, we'll never know if they're true or it'll take longer because social scientists are not involved. And we actually, I think, have a lot to contribute as the quantum decision theory literature shows, we can actually make advances that others then can pick up on and maybe see, oh, okay, wow. Even in the human sciences, we're seeing quantum effects being demonstrated, not just now with birds and plants, but now human beings are also being part of this. Um, but I would say that it is a wager to use Patrick Jackson's language. Um, it's a, my view of wagers is that, well, the reason you make a particular wager in social science is you think it's more likely to be true. So that's what the realist would say. And so that's why I make this particular wager, but it is a wager. It might be wrong, uh, but it is a lot of fun. And, it's, and the conceptual stuff that you can do is fascinating. And reading the conceptual literature in the philosophy of physics is just, it's mind boggling. Um, and so if you're bored, it's a great way to get out of boredom as a scholar. Um, but as an individual, especially as a young scholar, a graduate student, there would be risks going down this road. Um, and you know, I have two PhD students now at Ohio State that are, one's a second year, one's a third year. And they're both very serious about this stuff and they're doing dissertations or coming up with dissertations now. And it's challenging, um, and it's we'll see if they can get jobs. But you know that's the, the hope in the long run, obviously. Right. Yeah. I mean, there is a lot of sort of baffling <laughs> findings that come out of quantum theory uh, as well. And so some of the questions deal with, I think, implications related to uh, quantum theory and how they might shape social uh, life. So I'm going to ask some of those now. Um, so Thomas Breslin, who's a professor in our department. He asks, in moving toward using quantum methodology in the social sciences, are we moving toward moving toward panpsychism 
and toward giving much greater weight to insight in the social sciences. Interesting insight. Well, there is um, actually in the security dialogue special issue on quantum IR, one of the papers is about introspection and how introspection from a quantum perspective is actually really important and interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting paper. Leo, Leo Orlando is the author. Now that's not quite the same as insight. Um, I think that um, a quantum picture of the mind because it's not deterministic, it's not mechanical, the idea of insight and intuition resonate much more naturally to that kind of a picture of the mind than a picture of the mind as a huge complicated machine. I don't know how you would squeeze insight and intuition out of a machine. Um, so I think that in that sense, we are moving that way. But the first part of the question I've forgotten was, it was um, about panpsychism. Oh, panpsychism. Well, I mean, that's my own view of how you get consciousness in the picture and how it fits with quantum theory. And actually, there's been a huge surge of interest in panpsychism, not only among quantum people, but among philosophers of mind in the past 10, 15 years. So this is suddenly popular in a way that it hasn't been for a century or two. Um, but I don't think, I think that um, social scientists don't need to make any assumptions about panpsychism at all to do their work. If you want to do quantum work in social science, you can be completely pragmatic about it. You don't have to believe in the truth of it. You just have to say, this is a cool method. I'm going to try this out because it might work in this case. That's all you need. And if it works out well, then you might think, well, maybe this is true, but you still don't have to believe it. So there's no kind of um, loyalty test you have to pass in order to use quantum theory. I think I encourage people to just experiment with it, see if it works in your own domain. If it does, that's great, publish something and then do another one. If it doesn't work out, that's also useful to know because it might then help kill this thing before it gets out of control. Um, uh, <laughs> all right, uh, and a related question about sort of the fundamental philosophical foundations for this approach comes from Caroline McCulloch. Um, she asked, to what extent does this mirror the old philosophical debates about mind-body dualism? Also, my understanding of relativity and quantum physics by extension is that it's not a separate theory from the old laws, but that it's an extension of it at a greater scale. Framing it that way, does, this, does it change the argument? Well, I would distinguish quantum theory from relativity theory first. And, and one of the big um, conundrums in physics for the past century is that those two theories, they've been unable to combine them. And nobody has a clue how to combine them. Um, and in the discussion of quantum social science and quantum decision making and all this quantum literature that I read, relativity theory hardly ever comes up. And I think relativity theory really is because ultimately it's kind of an extension of a classical perspective is my impression, although I don't know enough about that to actually say to that with any confidence. Um, but it certainly doesn't figure much in the debates about quantum. I think it's more on the classical side. Um, the mind-body dualism, I mean, I, the mind-body problem is one of the main motivations in my view for going quantum because a quantum perspective can actually accommodate consciousness and the mind in a way that I think a classical view cannot, but that's of course very contested. Um, there are some people who think, think that quantum theory actually supports dualism. Uh, my own view is that it supports panpsychism. There are probably others that think other things. So I don't think there's any agreement on this. Um, but, that, but again, that may be something that social scientists don't have to worry about as long as, and this is for me one of the most important reasons I did this book and then this subsequent work, it's about consciousness. And social science, when I was brought up in social science, you never talked about consciousness. There was no consciousness. It's if we were all machines. And part of the agenda here is to find a place for consciousness in social science and, of course, in the social and in the universe more generally. And I think quantum theory can do that in a way that classical can't. So we have another question from a grad student, Rob Piper. Um, he says, so is the quantum mind concept similar to the concept of the mastermind group or that of the social mind? Um, can the disentanglement, and this is, I think, a separate question, the second one, can the disentanglement from the quantum mind potentially manifest itself in the form of negative physical maladies? Um, and just to add to that, I mean, how does this idea that we're all one entity um, relate to other ideas about kind of holism in the social world uh, are those kind of pre-figuring the quantum move in a way um, that they're yes, tapping into I, that idea? Yes, I mean holism um, is what the quantum theorists themselves say that quantum theory is deeply holistic. 
Um, and there's a very deep connection between holistic philosophy and quantum theory. And, and there's a fair bit of literature on that among philosophers of physics and stuff like that. Um, holism is not the same thing as collectivism and a lot of other things it has a very particular meaning. And so, but, but <clears throat> it's really relational. Um, I didn't, I don't know, I've never heard the term mastermind. So except in just casual conversation, I'm not sure what that part of the question was about. Um, I would say that this idea of a universal mind, it's not a mind in the same way that um, each of us has a mind, um, although it's physically located, presumably in all individual humans. The idea is that it's we are entangled at the level of potentiality. And something I didn't emphasize in the talk, but is, is a big deal in several of the approaches to quantum theory, is the difference between actuality and potentiality. And what quantum theory does, classical theory is all about actuality. And what quantum theory has a robust and irreducible idea of potentiality. And that's where this um, universal mind exists. It exists in what's called superposition and an entangled form. It's really a potential. And so when two people come together, they're suddenly their minds form a single potential and they can do whatever they can as a single mind if they think that way, or if they can think separately, then they'll do things differently. Um, but yeah, the nature of this kind of universal mind is it is a little murky, um, but it's that's because the way it's a it's a wave function, and the whole idea of the wave function is itself kind of murky and hard to understand. So, well, if I can follow up on that point with a question of my own about how this entanglement, which is essential to the argument in the paper, actually gets created, because um, you mentioned a number of times the role that language plays in, in entangling uh, different individuals into kind of super position super position. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you mean, what kind of language, I guess, are you referring to? Are these actual languages like English? Everyone that speaks English is somehow super positioned relative to each other. Um, are there more specific discourses that create this kind of entanglement? I'm just wondering about the kind of extent of entanglement, what generates that entanglement. Maybe I'm still stuck in the classical mindset where <laughs> I'm looking for that kind of link. Um, and, and denying this action at a distance. But I also think that has implications for this idea that we're alienated from each other and from nature, right? We don't share languages or share even means of communication with everybody. Uh, some groups we don't communicate with, don't know how to communicate with, and the natural world in particular, right? We don't know how to speak to nature. Um, so would we always be then alienated from nature, um, even with well. a quantum? There, there are interesting books now coming out about communication with plants and, and plant intelligence and plant consciousness and entanglement with plants and stuff like this. And um, there's a it's sort of a cottage industry. Um, but no, you're right. Obviously, we don't have the same kind of entanglement. And I guess the, the larger question of where it comes from, in humans, I would say that language is the fundamental or the most important thing. And that's where, because language is so uh, useful to, to make social objects and, and, and everything else. Um, but most organisms don't have language. All organisms on this view are quantum organisms. They're all entangled with their environments, but the entanglements for them go through vision, hearing, the, the regular five senses. Maybe there's a sixth sense um, that humans have lost, perhaps. I think actually that's probably true. Um, so humans also are entangled visually with each other and through our ears and everything else. It's just the language is what enables us to do so much more. If we didn't have language, we couldn't do a whole lot with the entanglement we have. With the language we can do, we can make civilizations. So, um, but yes, we're not, the, but our entanglement with nature then is more at the level of vision and everything else, but also, um, well, I don't know about mind, yeah. In a sense, language, and then about whether it's English and French or just language in general, I think it's language in general. Um, but it's any organism that can speak um, in a translatable way with us. Um, so ETs, I suppose, if they could talk to us, um, would count as that part of that universal language. But you know, bears don't, because bears can't understand our language at all. Okay. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of this. Kind of, it gets to another set of questions that I want to raise, which is about. It comes back to something we talked about earlier in the Q&A, which is how you actually bring about this new thinking that takes a quantum perspective, right? Because there's so many weird, 
phenomena in quantum physics, um, so many counterintuitive ways of thinking about the world. How is it that we get from where we are now, like deeply socialized into a classical physics worldview to a world of quantum physics? Um, and that touches on a number of questions that Sebastian Arangibel asks. Um, the biggest challenge in promoting a quantum pedagogy is that explaining quantum physics remains linguistically and pedagogically difficult. So practically speaking, how do we equip educators, especially those far removed from STEM fields with the ability to impart this knowledge? Um, I'm gonna ask a couple because they're all sort of related to this question. So Leo Cosio asks, uh, how do we overcome the classical barrier in society? So you mentioned implementing a new pedagogy in preschool. Is that the most practical place for implementation? Um, and this, I think, goes back maybe to the earlier question about how you sort of bring this change about in society. I don't know if you have more you could say on that. Yeah, no, I think, um, well, obviously such a change would be extraordinarily difficult and would take time. Um, fortunately, there are many uh, aspects of social life that are already quite holistic. And there are many ways in which human beings already implicitly recognize that we're entangled. They just may not use that language. Um, so that we have a lot of kind of natural resources to work with already that just aren't explicitly quantum. Um, but you're right that in terms of what's actually taught to students, whether it's at the graduate methods training level or in kindergarten, that's all when it comes down to the implicit physics of it, and the logic of it is all classical, the whole thing. Um, and you probably have to start at the top and train um, <coughs> teachers, college students, or, or train teachers to teach college students about this stuff. And they become high school teachers and, high, and you just go all the way down the line. So it's a matter about training new kinds of teachers. But actually, I had actually had a weird idea. I don't think I'll ever do this, but I think it would be fun and interesting and doable to write a book trying to explain quantum theory for kids. And it turns out there are some books like this. They're for the sort of seven to 10 year old set. Um, I think you could even go younger because if you can boil down the lessons of quantum theory, which are really the lessons I think that we all learn by kindergarten. You know, they say that you don't really need to learn anything more after kindergarten because that's all the life lessons you need. Well, quantum theory would teach you those lessons. It would tell you because those lessons are relational they're about getting along with people, they're about cooperation, they're about being a nice guy and everything else, right? So, um, so I think actually a book for kids from a quantum perspective, it could be done if you could somehow distill these very abstract and complex ideas into sort of pithy bumper sticker lessons, um, which may be the lessons that many kids are already learning. But um, the key thing would be learning not to perceive other people as objects. That's, I think, the key thing. Other minds are not objects. Other people are not objects. They're entangled with us. So, um, and it's that separation of subject and object that I think is the fundamental problem that has to be overcome. And that, that would require a paradigm shift, I think, ultimately. And we, we had a, another question, which is related to this, and from Valeria Popova about how you would explain an idea like this to political leaders like Trump uh, with his America First views. <laughs> um, given not only their age of, of them and their advisors, uh, but also their kind of stubborn attitude towards changing their minds. Um, do you see, could, is this kind of gonna be a generational shift in other words, where over time through, you know, actuarial uh, processes, the new generation will replace the old and we'll have a quantum world? Or do you see this more, and I guess this goes back to Tom and Isha's question too, is this more a potential revolution where we, more quickly kind of shift our thinking. Um, well, that's a really good, that's a really interesting, I haven't thought about this. I mean, I think, I mean, Thomas Kuhn tells us these things happen generationally, primarily. Um, and that's probably going to be the larger force. And certainly, I get a lot of email about this stuff, and it's almost all from young people. Um, although I got a very nice email, actually, just a few weeks ago from a retired professor um, a political science, he's in his, I believe he's in his 80s, and he read the whole book, he's an Americanist, read the whole book, and he wrote me this wonderful letter just saying how great the book was, and his big takeaway from the book was that it was the first thing that he'd ever read as a social scientist that gave him hope, and that's exactly, I think, the message that I 
also see in quantum theory is that there is hope for stuff that we now think maybe is hopeless. And so I'm not sure how I got onto that. Well, I guess that relates to the generational thing. But I do think that the more conscious effort that is made by entrepreneur, you know, you know uh, idea entrepreneurs, so to speak, and the more research that's done will move this along faster. But the political leaders will probably be the last ones to endorse it, just like they'll be the last ones to endorse. Well, actually, they're coming around on the UFO problem now, too. So maybe they'll come around on quantum theory. <laughs> um, and then the world state. <laughs> yeah, the world state. Yeah, I haven't figured out how that relates to this yet, but that's maybe a future project. But, I mean, part of that project of sort of um, preaching quantum worldview um, would be, you know, it, it helps to have allies in that effort, right? And I guess this gets back to other questions that you've already addressed, but uh, we have a few more on that, uh, at least one more on that point. Um, making connections with works in philosophy, uh, social theory that makes similar kinds of arguments and finding ways to build that link. So this is a question from Joaquin Pedroso. Uh, so he says, he was an instructor in our department. He says, thank you for your talk, Dr. Went. Did Heideggerian phenomenology serve as any kind of inspiration for this work? Um, um, Heidegger scares me more than any, I'd rather read Hegel than Heidegger. <laughs> Um, so I don't know anything about Heidegger, except that there are a couple of quantum theorists who think that Heidegger has a lot to say. Um, and I don't know how good their knowledge of Heidegger is because they're quantum brain people and quantum theorists, and they may not really understand Heidegger at all. But um, undoubtedly, from what I just casually have a sense of how Heidegger fits into the intellectual tradition of the 20th century, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of resonances. <coughs> with these quantum ideas, yeah. And do you see it as sort of part of your strategy to cultivate links with these other approaches or do you kind of lay out your perspective and hope others see resonances or hear resonances in it? Uh, I'm just thinking more in terms of the sort of strategy of a quantum social science in terms of actually becoming more widely embraced. How do we, and this is always, I guess, the challenge is how you get from point A to point B. No, that's a good question. And, and I mean, there's the, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't, you know, and there's only so much you can do. Um, I think that making connections for people, pointing out connections is good. Of course, the response that I inevitably get then is, well, we've already got post-structuralism. What do we need your fancy quantum theory for? We've already got new materialism. What do we need this stuff for? So that that's the question that comes up when I make those connections. Um, but I'm working on the response to that kind of thing. Um, <coughs> but the first part of your question was, and I just lost it. Um, so making connections to other approaches. The strategy and, of. Um, a strategy. Um, I think, oh, I guess the other thing I would say there is that I think the best um, argument for adopting, or the thing that will convince the most people to experiment with these ideas is success of others in using them. So if other people, if, if, if you know, pioneers start doing it like they have done with quantum decision theory and it pays off big time, that's big encouragement for the next generation. So people have got to get out in front and show that it works. And if it doesn't work, that's also instructive. But the good news here is that people who go out in front and take a chance win either way. If you show that it works, you're a hero and you're, you know, you founded a new discipline you show it didn't work, well, you've killed something that should never have come alive in the first place. So I think in that sense, we gain either way in terms of our overall knowledge of the world. So I have need, another need question. In a sense. Sorry. Right. Another question that came in that's still on this point um, is from Christine Bianco. She's a grad student in our department. Uh, she asks, your presentation of quantum theory seems to challenge a number of entrenched power structures outside of academia. Capitalism in its current forms in many ways relies on individualism and our separation from others. So how can this shift in pedagogy take place against such ingrained power structures? Well, I think power structures are always in process. They're malleable to some extent. Every, they're being performed every day differently by different people. New young people come along, they perform the structures a bit differently than the old ones did. Um, and I would say that none of these things are you know, frozen in time, they're evolving. And I do think that um, 
a quantum view kind of is is very insidious in the sense that if it gets inside people's heads, it can really have a subversive effect on these kinds of structures because people begin to real see themselves and see the structures in a completely different way. Um, but the structures are there and they're going to slow things down. There's no doubt. Um, capitalism would, would, but I think capitalism is already evolving. I think the pressure of climate change and green capitalism or whatever we want to call it, I think capitalism is going to evolve organically anyway. Quantum view would push it further and faster, perhaps, in a more environmentally friendly direction. There's a whole sub-literature on environmental philosophy, panpsychism, and quantum stuff, which is kind of cool. Um, so, but but yes, this is a this would take 50 years, probably something, give or take. Right about when the UFOs finally land on the White House lawn. So, <laughs> so. Well, since you mentioned UFOs, we have a question. Uh, this is from Felix Martin on that. Point. And we are coming towards to the end of the time for our uh, discussion. So we got about five minutes left. So um, depending on how you want to handle this question, we might have time for one or two more. Um, mm -hmm. But this is on the UFO question. So as someone mentioned, this is from Felix Martin. Someone mentioned to me recently that you've developed an interest in UFOs. Uh, what do you plan to do with that type of data in relation to your theoretical efforts in the social sciences generally and IR specifically? Um, well, I think, um, <laughs> um, well, I'm thinking about writing a short book on UFOs. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to do that. Um, but the US, I don't know how much you know people follow the UFO issue, but this issue since 2017 has become much more um, uh, substantial an issue. Um, there were hearings in the Senate Intelligence Committee last year, and they asked the Defense Department to produce a report on all their UFO activities, which supposedly is coming out later this year. Um, and of course, there are the famous Navy videos of UFOs that pilots have taken and stuff like this. So the whole the whole climate on this issue, the 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 the, um, the tide of opinion, I think, is really the winds are changing on this issue in in, in a pretty dramatic way. Um, now that doesn't mean we're going to know anything much more very soon, um, but I think this issue. So the actual question though was about I've forgotten the actual question part of it. It was um, I think it was a sort of how. How is this going to relate to IR? Um, well, I think it relates directly to IR because the one angle that I've thought about with for a book is that most of the pro UFO people, right, the believers, all of them want complete immediate disclosure of all the secret files in the Defense Department's bowels, right? They want everything out in the open. And the more I've thought about that, the more I worry that that would set that could trigger a lot of people. And we've seen what can happen when people get triggered lately. And you know there is an argument for secrecy on this issue. So I worry that actually too aggressive exposure of whatever's going on with UFOs might actually be threatening to the, the order that the state is trying to create and maybe not threatening to international order, but certainly threatening to domestic order. And I, I'm actually more afraid of my fellow Americans if the UFO issue gets aired out more than I am of any ETs. I think the ETs are way less dangerous than our fellow countrymen, some of whom could go crazy if this issue comes out. So, but an, an irony of this UFO stuff, and then I'll stop, is that paper was published in 2008, the one article I wrote on this. Not one academic has ever written a response to that article. Not one. It's been cited a few times for other things, but never been cited for its claim that UFOs should be taken seriously. So the article, the response to the article proves there's a taboo on the topic, first of all, which is the <laughs> thesis of the article. So that's kind of a nice benefit. Um, but I'm particularly wondering where are all the critical theorists? You know, I've been getting hit over the head for 30 years that I'm not critical enough. I'm a thin constructivist, blah, 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 right? And where are the crits on the UFO issue? Nowhere. They're part of the mainstream. So Let's get the critical theorists out front on the UFO issue. I could use some allies here on that in particular because I don't have a lot of allies. Um, and, and then um, maybe we'll get more traction. But, the, but this is, it's big news. What's going to happen is big news, I think. The Defense Department is going to release more videos probably. And, you know, it's, it's anyway, don't get me started. <laughs> Too late, I think. But yeah, right, that's right. yeah we'll see. Um, that sounds... I mean, there could be a lot of interesting things that come out um, in the next year or two on this point. Yes, so. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, and, and your book can help sort of speak to that information too um, and help frame it. So I think we 
are at our stopping point for the talk. Um, okay. So I want to thank Professor Wendt for joining us and fielding the many myriad questions that came um, from different perspectives uh, <laughs> and for sharing this uh, challenging and really interesting paper with us. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, thank you to all the participants who um, showed up and asked questions in particular. It's great to have this kind of engagement and, and discussion uh, with these ideas. And thank you again to the Green School for helping to make this possible. And can I also say thank you too? I just, of course. I, that was an excellent, I mean, that's one of the most intensive Q and A's that I've had in a while. Um, I must have 25 questions here that I have notes on. I don't know how good the notes are, so I'll have to get stuff from John. But thank you very much to everybody for taking it seriously. And um, the questions were really constructive and very helpful. So thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, I guess, do I end the, the meeting then? Um, or is that, I think that's uh, Wesley Sanchez's responsibility, but um, Alex, if you wanna hang around after. Yeah, now do I do anything or do I just sit right here on this screen? I think you and I will just sit on the screen. Okay. While, uh, I handle.